So in the really early days of this channel, I made a video on Godzilla King of the Monsters, and in it, I asked people in the comments if they wanted me to do more Godzilla movies. And now, several years later, I finally got one commenter who said do it, so I'm doing it. For Japan, the 1960s was a hopeful time. The post-war Reconstruction era was well in the past, and the country, eager to let its imperial ambitions remain a thing of the past, was in the midst of a so-called economic miracle, with the standard of living on a rapid upward trajectory as goods and services became cheaper and more abundant. Television was the new cultural phenomenon of the day, and popular culture was seeing a dramatic shift away from the somber and meditative reflections of the occupation days, and towards a more diverse and unapologetically entertaining catalog of delights. Over at Toho Studios, the popularity of kaiju movies was still going strong, but audiences were feeling less interested in the terror of Godzilla ripping through Tokyo, and more into lighter fare like Godzilla taking on King Kong outside of the populated areas of Japan. Of course, Godzilla was hardly Toho's only giant monster, with a rapidly growing stable of monsters that included Rodan, Gorath, and Varan the Unbelievable. Eager to ride the success of King Kong vs. Godzilla, Toho knew it needed to pit Godzilla against one of these, while simultaneously offering something that could be more family-friendly and optimistic. Following a brutal typhoon, a giant egg washes up on the beach and is promptly purchased by greedy businessmen intent on turning it into a theme park attraction. The intrepid reporter Ichiro Sakai, however, is on the case, and just after he learns the egg really belongs to Mothra, another familiar monster appears from beneath the ruined sands to wreak havoc. Sakai, along with the photographer Junko and scientist Professor Mira, then seeks the help of Mothra to stop the rampaging dinosaur. But how can they convince her when humans refuse to return her egg? And how could she possibly stop the deadly destruction of a determined Godzilla? Ishiro Honda, who had already directed the original Godzilla, King Kong vs. Godzilla and Mothra, along with many others, was once again put in the director's chair for Mothra vs. Godzilla. He worked closely with screenwriter Shinichi Sekizawa, who had written Battle in Outer Space and Varan the Unbelievable, and would later lay the groundwork for the original Ultraman, to turn the basic story treatment into something cohesive that could take advantage of the two men's different strengths. Sekizawa injected humor and lighthearted drama, while Honda supplied the underlying themes. Early scripts were ambitious in scope, including more monster action and city stomping, but with both budget limitations and the operating ethos of making the movie more family-friendly, a lot of this was changed, streamlined, and reworked. Perhaps the biggest change was eliminating Rolissica, the fictional nation from Mothra, which was home to the script's primary villains, and then dramatically reworking the final battle, which was between Godzilla and the adult form of Mothra. Hey, do you have a sci-fi classic you want me to cover? Drop it down in the comments below, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, please consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you still haven't gotten enough of me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emcgill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more science fiction classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. The primary human lead of the film, the reporter Ishiro Sakai, is played by Mr. Handsome himself, Akira Takarada, who had previously starred as Ogata in the original Godzilla, and would go on to appear in a few more Godzilla films, along with King Kong Escapes. 
His rookie photographer, Junko, is played by the rising starlet Yuriko Hoshi, who had previously worked under Honda on Inao, Story of an Iron Arm, in which she had a very minor role, but her scene was cut from the final film. Honda took the time to formally apologize to her prior to the start of filming Mothra vs. Godzilla. The secondary male lead, Professor Mira, is played by Hiroshi Koizumi, who had played a completely different scientist, Dr. Chujo, in the original Mothra, as well as the primary lead in the first Godzilla sequel, Godzilla Raids Again. As for the villains, the greedy Kumayama and Torahata, they are played by Toho veterans Yoshifumi Tajima and Kenji Sahara, respectively, both of whom were excited to ham it up as almost cartoonish antagonists for the first half of the film, only pushed aside once Godzilla becomes the primary threat. The rest of the cast is made up of Toho regulars like Yu Fujuki as Nakamura and Jun Tazaki as Maruta, alongside returning pop icons the Peanuts as Mothra's twin beauties, the Shobijin. As for Godzilla, he was played once again by Haruo Nakajima, who helped design a new and more streamlined suit, called the Musogoji suit, which is a vast improvement over the more goofy looking ones from the previous films. If you spend any time with hardcore Godzilla fans, you'll know there's a long running debate about which suit is the quote unquote best, with the Musogoji suit a popular choice. Personally, while I do think it's one of the better ones, the reflecting eyes and wobbly upper lip are a bit weird for me. I'll discuss my favorite suit when I inevitably get around to reviewing the movie in which it appears. It should be noted that much of the suit had to be rebuilt after part of the head accidentally caught fire, an event Nakajima didn't even notice, and ultimately wound up being one of the coolest visuals in the movie. Though Godzilla bumbling and pratfalling after his arrival was a deliberate choice by Honda and Sekizawa, the beast only really destroys buildings on accident, Nakajima did have to film the toppling of Nogoya Castle twice, as the model was too strong and didn't crumble properly the first time, and the second time had to be assisted by crew just off camera, pushing it over. Older suits were used in a few long shots, especially in places where Godzilla would be partially submerged, and though a new Mothra model was built to maintain an appropriate scale with Godzilla, the original was still used in some close-ups and in shots that take place on Infant Island. As for the island, Honda originally wanted it to be much bigger and a more devastating set, though that was mostly replaced with the boring paper mache rocks we see here either for budgetary reasons, or because Toho didn't want to have anything too disturbing on camera. Oh, and you see this weird turtle thing? It's a whole thing in the fandom. You can even get toys and models of it in Japan, it's wild. Anyway, special effects coordinator Aiji Tsuburaya, upon seeing one in action in America, insisted that Toho invest in a state-of-the-art optical printer called the Oxberry 1900. For a brief moment, the only two in use anywhere in the world were at Disney and Toho. Tsuburaya needed it to clean up a lot of the compositing work on Mothra vs. Godzilla, and though by modern standards the compositing does look unsophisticated, it was incredible for the time, helped along by brilliant scale set design and perfect eyeline matches. The music was composed by Akira Ifukube, the man responsible for the original Godzilla theme. Though he didn't write the orchestral Mothra theme or the earwormy Mothra song sung by the Peanuts, he did find a way to perfectly blend them together with his own work to create one of the best scores of any Godzilla film, if not the best. I really wish I could play some of it for you to show you what I mean, but Trust me, this is peak Ifukube. In post-production, one scene, in which the US assists in attacking Godzilla with frontier missiles at Tarada Beach, was cut out of the Japanese version of the film, for fear of Japanese audiences reacting to the sight of American missiles hitting Japanese soil. The scene was later restored in the American version, but I'll get to that in a minute. 
Mothra vs. Godzilla opened in Japan in late April of 1964, with an estimated domestic box office gross of 3.2 billion yen against its budget of just 123 million yen, ensuring the legacy of both of the headlining kaiju for decades to come. This was good, as while Mothra vs. Godzilla was still rapping, Toho had already put the pair's next outing, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, into production to be released the very same year. In May, American distributor Henry G. Saperstein acquired the rights to distribute the film in America, and then promptly sold them to American International Pictures, which did far less to the movie than was standard for foreign imports at the time. In fact, the American cut, called Godzilla vs. The Thing, is nearly identical to the Japanese one, with the biggest addition being the aforementioned missile attack and a surprisingly good English language dub done by Tetra Studios. You may think whatever you like. The egg belongs to the island. I see. And you think I just accept your word, is that right? I can't for the life of me find any American box office figures, but it reportedly did very well, especially after it started running on TV where it served as many young kids' first introduction to Godzilla. Today, Mothra vs. Godzilla is highly regarded as one of the best, if not the best, of the original Godzilla sequels, highlighting the perfect balance between the stark seriousness of the original Godzilla and the goofball entertainment of later Showa-era efforts. It's easy to see why, too, as it has one of the most memorable title bouts and a really good human story that doesn't overstay its welcome. I especially like how the unavoidable military confrontation with Godzilla is more competent than usual, making for better scenes where it actually seems like the terrible lizard might actually be on the ropes. For me though, the movie really shines in how well it lays out Honda's main thesis about the so-called Brotherhood of Man. It's easy to look at the movie as a damning portrait of humanity's capacity for greed and destruction, with Godzilla continuing his tradition of being a metaphor for the cosmic retribution wrought by humanity for its sins, and Mothra only reluctantly fighting him due to her egg being in danger. However, that reading misses the point of the final act, where the hatched Mothra larvae contain Godzilla. And why do they do this? to help protect the human children that Godzilla is about to crush. The fact that they do it by restraining rather than attempting to kill the beast is just a punctuation mark. As I see it, this is actually one of Ishiro Honda's most optimistic films in the end. Though he doesn't hold back on the idea that humanity has done great evil, he makes it abundantly clear that the future can save us. It's no coincidence that Mothra's children are the ones to take down the rampaging monster, and if the message isn't clear enough, the last few lines of dialogue are about as unsubtle as a story can get. The only way to protect ourselves from harm is to build a better future, to trust in younger generations to succeed where older ones have failed. Yes, all of humanity is responsible for what happened to Infant Island. The name of which, by the way, actually is just a coincidence. But all of humanity is also responsible for nurturing a better tomorrow. In other words, this movie is a reflection of the world Japan was trying to build during their great economic miracle. A responsible tomorrow filled with peace, cooperation, and brotherhood. Honda would eventually get disillusioned with the more kid-oriented direction Godzilla would go in the years that followed, but with Mothra vs. Godzilla, he was able to say exactly what he'd been trying to say ever since he first unleashed the King of the Monsters on Tokyo. Therefore, it cannot be said that Mothra vs. Godzilla is anything but a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. Which Godzilla title fight is your favorite? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, hit that like and subscribe for the children. Thank you for watching, and until next time when we'll start off the spooky season with the movie that marked the end of an era at Universal, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
My idea is to ask it for assistance against Godzilla. That's it? You're a genius! That's what I think. Do you think I should get a raise? 